بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Good evening ladies and gentlemen to our guests who are watching us online and to our audience who are attending this session here with us My name is Fahad Al-Wihan I welcome you all to this great panel as a part of the 16 Windows program that offer you the chance of experience the kingdom diverse culture from this beautiful Palm Garden in the Saudi Pavilion at Expo 2020 Dubai. In today's session, we are going to talk about the King Salman Charter for Architecture and Urbanism. I am certain it will be a great session with a great panelist we have tonight. Without further delay, allow me to introduce this week's panelist. I will start with the CEO of the Architecture and uh, the, of the Architecture, Art and Design Commission, Dr. Sumaya Sleiman. Dr. Sumaya is a, a specialist and expert in her field. She obtained her PhD degree from the University of Newcastle in Britain. She also obtained a postdoctoral fellowship from Ibn Khaldun program at the MIT University in US. Welcome to Dr. Sumaya. Our next guest is the architect Ali Ashaibi. He is the CEO of Albia Consulting Firm. Please welcome to Architect Ali. <laughs> and our third guest is the Saudi designer Ahmed Sami Angawi. He studied industrial design at the Bratt Institute in New York, and then he completed his master's degree in traditional art in the Prince School of Traditional Art in London. Please welcome Mr. Angawi. Thanks. Thank you for the Saudi Pavilion for hosting us tonight. We are very glad to be here. Let's start this panel by an introduction about our topic presented by Dr. Sumeya. Hello, everyone. Um, it's, uh, it gives me great pleasure and it's an honor to be here speaking to you about an initiative that is very dear to our hearts. Um, and also, I think in terms of um, what we um, are presenting here today, it's still very timely and connected to a lot of activations that are still happening within Saudi Arabia. So today we'll be talking about perhaps one of the biggest uh, initiatives that we launched is the Architecture and Design Commission um, in, uh, at the end of uh, 2021. And we call it the King Salman Charter for Architecture and Urbanism, or in Arabic, it's Mithaq al-Malik Salman al-Umrani. And the idea behind it is really um, quite grand. And I hope you will see that and it will be part of our discussion um, in, the next, um, in the next hour. So I'll start perhaps with the, not sure where to point. Okay, got it. So I'll start perhaps first with presenting a few of the buildings that we have. Um, so this, for instance, is a, a top view of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Riyadh. And um, it is an award-winning building um, that has been designed um, and built in the 80s. Um, it's still quite spectacular in terms of scale, concept, design, um, and a lot of other considerations within that. And next we have a project, which is Wadi Hanifa. And you might look at this as something that you know, could be much more environmental, but there is a huge effort in the rehabilitation of a wadi, the whole valley, um, in a, a length of over 120 kilometers, if I'm not mistaken, where there's a lot of spaces that have been created. Um, and it's not, let's say, um, a place that was always like this. This was a place that actually was quite um, damaged in terms of the environment and also um, perhaps it's sewage and garbage. Um, and the turnaround from an environmental pers uh, perspective is um, ex uh, very commendable um, for you know, a city like Riyadh. The next project, again, is an award-winning project. And here we are looking at the Grand Mosque and also uh, the Justice Palace at the center of Riyadh. And here we're looking at something that kind of revives uh, the identity of the core of a city. Um, but in a perhaps different scale, in a different texture, and also hierarchy without necessarily losing the essence of what came before. 
And here we have another project, Dweg Palace, or as some may know it as the Diplomatic Club, as it was called at the beginning. Um, a playful building that combines multiple concepts like the fortress, the tent, the oasis, for purposes that are really very recreational and uh, social as well. And finally, a project that is called the King, uh, the King Abdelaziz Historical Center, which is again at the heart of Riyadh, an area that brings together multiple buildings that were either historic and restored and rehabilitated, or new builds like the National Museum, uh, Darat al-Malik Abdelaziz, which is a national archive, um, and other functions around it, all set within a very lush and green setting for parks. So if you look at all of these buildings and projects, the idea comes to mind, you know, what do they have in common? And there is something in common, which I think for a lot of architects and designers um, is not necessarily always very evident at the beginning of these discussions, which is that all of these are a lot more connected, not necessarily in style, but rather in terms of values and impact of what they are trying to achieve at the level of a city. So I'll stop at that part, but then tell you a story that I think has happened in a lot of perhaps the Middle Eastern countries, but then also um, in many of the modernizing nations around the world, where really what happened was, you know, with modernization coming into a country, there's always this kind of shift and rift between what was contemporary or traditional. As, so having, let's say, a, a real discontinuity between the two. And in Riyadh specifically, we witnessed this uh, specifically in the 70s and 80s, perhaps the most. And coming from a one square kilometer area of Riyadh, that is a, a walled city, and then going beyond that with a lot of developments that had very little reference to what came before, was actually quite problematic and something that we started to notice as these layers of developments started to build up. So the urban fabric reflected something that we did not know previously, and also from an architectural point of view, there was a lot of importation and new styles that came in where there was very little reference to our national culture or identity, and a lot of these conversations and voices became heard uh, that uh, criticized that. Now, if we then go to the story of uh, King Salman, and specifically in the time where he was the governor of Riyadh, and that's actually not a very short time. It spans more than 50 years. So here we actually see a little bit of a change. And from a leadership perspective and also from a personal perspective, King Salman has always taken a great interest in the development of the city from a source of love and pride where perhaps others would look at uh, development from a point of view, we want to modernize and to show the world who we are. There was always a sense that we are very proud of who we are and this needs to be reflected. And there are many considerations that actually were incorporated in the different briefs of the projects, um, whether at an early stage or even perhaps at a later stage, sometimes even getting to the point where a project is completely designed, but then stopping the implementation because it just was not right for the place that it was built in. So if we start to look at, let's say, that history of King Salman in Riyadh, and then also start to draw many of the lessons that we want to take out, we get to something very, very different. Now, in 2017, uh, uh, there is already the first attempt perhaps to provide a name or a term that brings all of these together. And the name that was coined at the time was Salmani architecture. And since then, there have been a few discussions, some articles around what does that actually mean? Are we talking about styles? Are we talking about materials? Are we talking about something that is very specific to Riyadh or even going beyond that? And many of these discussions go in circles around the projects where many of these projects are um, already not, um, let's say, contested in any way that they fall under this name. But then the question for us when we got the mandate to start to formalize what does Salmani architecture actually mean, we got to a point where we started to look at the essence of it rather than the aesthetics related only. And this is where with the charter we are now advocating for a new design philosophy that builds on values where we want to advocate for value-driven architecture. And that means that in the, uh, let's say, case of Riyadh, we have seen 40 or 50 years of development 
in the spirit of this charter already that produced a lot of award-winning architecture. And we can see this model as something that can be replicated and taken to other places under this charter. And this is how the charter of King Salman uh, actually came about. And this is our logo and also quite architecturally inspired um, in terms of the typography, um, trying to get that uh, sense across here as well. Now, to give you a bit of a brief about what the Charter is, um, the Charter's vision is really to create architectural excellence and improve the quality of life of all residents through forming architectural environments that build on cultural and environmental um, heritage and also kind of emulate the future. So really, who are we now? What are we basing that on with the ultimate aim to serve communities? And we, there are definitely a number of reasons why we need this now. So there we have um, a lot of teachings and lessons learned that we want to bring forward. We want to also have some sort of a unified language of where we want to go architecturally and uh, to really make that as something that you know, can recognize and make us all talk about you know, something um, that is quite common. And ultimately the aim really is to improve quality of life in the built environment and make that part of our development uh, journey. So the charter, as, as it is, there's always the first question that comes to mind is, ah, so you're proposing a code. Definitely not. And this is why we have this slide. You know, what is the charter and what it is it not? So we're saying that the charter is really a set of core values. It's also a methodology um, that is, I have to say, also quite loose, not necessarily uh, very structured, but that gives a lot of creative freedom. And the charter is also a reference, so something that we can go back to and really explore you know, how we want to continue from. But it's not a code. It's also not a historicist charter, so we don't want to call for replicating and duplicating what has happened in vernacular architecture. And it's definitely not a common style, not across the kingdom, not across the world, or not even across any city that is out there. What are these values, you ask? These are our core values. And the idea is that we have six values where every two values are actually very well connected to each other. So the first two values that we look at are continuity and authenticity. And in those, we're really thinking about space, or let's say place, and time. So we're looking at a historical continuity, making sure that this building or project fits into the historical narrative that we have in a specific locale. And then in terms of place, you know, the question is always, can I move this building to somewhere else and would it make sense? Or is this actually very much rooted in its, uh, in its locale? And how can I make that connection very authentic um, and, uh, um, and robust? The two other values that, that we have next are really all centered around humans. And here we're looking at human centricity that really has to be something that is um, the foremost consideration in any design project from the outset, thinking about the individuals um, with different capabilities, demographics and so on, but then also community. And the community component really comes into play with the livability. Because this is where we now, instead of just thinking about architecture, we're also thinking about what does this place or project actually enable from a community perspective? Is this a place that promotes healthy living? Is this a place that brings people together? So we have a lot of societal goals, I think, where design can play a key role, and this is one of the values that we advocate within the Charter. And the last two values that we have are um, uh, sustainability and also innovation. With sustainability, I think everyone's on the same page. If we look at historical environments or vernacular uh, buildings, that is already kind of implicit and embedded in it. But how do we take that forward as something that becomes our default setting? And then perhaps the most contested um, value, innovation, which kind of seems to a lot of people to not necessarily link up with many of the projects that I showed, is actually something that has always been embedded in the way that we think about development and how can we improve and how can we make things better. So these are the six values and the way we understand them to be connected is, you know, if we think of them in the abstract, that's all well and good, but then also how do we then 
take them forward. So we have three realms of application. So we can apply them to the physical realm, we can apply them to the sociocultural realm, and we can also make it very personal so that it's the sensory and also experiential realm. We believe that in the application of the six values in these three realms, that's how we get to design excellence, and that is really the core of what we are advocating within the Charter. So we start with the story of Riyadh, but we are also taking it outside of Riyadh uh, with, let's say, uh, the activations around exhibitions, networking events, and so on, uh, that are still under uh, ongoing in Saudi Arabia. And this is the first international event that we actually uh, bring out the charter in. So it's really great to have uh, this amazing audience. And in terms of you know, the subsectors that this applies to, we're looking at four of the ones that are under the mandate of the Architecture and Design Commission, which are architecture, urban design and planning, landscape architecture, and also interior design. Now, if we are looking at you know, Riyadh, that is from a historical perspective linked to Nejdi architecture, and looking at some of the buildings that have been produced, as contemporary interpretations of who we were maybe at the time that they were built. We have so much potential with the diversity that we have within Saudi Arabia that if we start to apply this charter in the different vernaculars that we have, that the new identities that we will be able to identify with will have you know, this abundance of creativity um, you know, coming about. And obviously this is something that, yes, we start quite heavily in Saudi Arabia, but it's also um, an initiative that we want to launch as an international initiative, because especially when it comes to the incentivization of it, uh, there will also be an international award uh, that will be open to an international audience um, as well. So with that in mind, I conclude with a quote from His Majesty King Salman. Uh, saying that today in Saudi Arabia, we see development that combines authenticity and modernity in architecture and urbanism. And this is how we would like to continue. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sumeya, for explaining the King uh, Salman Charter for Architecture and Urbanism. Um, we would like also to invite architect Ali to present uh, on the screen, please. We have an issue with the mic, yeah. Can we have a mic check, please? Yeah, I think it's working now. What I would like to start with is that, how do we look at architecture? Uh, in uh, our modern life, we departed from uh, heritage. Uh, heritage everywhere in uh, all the continents had uh, lived with its uh, uh, environment, with, uh, with the limitations. But in modern uh, development, we, we were, especially in Saudi Arabia and the developing countries, we were actually educated and got examples from Western cold countries architecture, which is basically influenced by the cold climate and the need for exposure to the sun. And in these two slides, you can see uh, a European city and uh, a village in, in the desert of Saudi Arabia. Uh, there is basic difference between these two environments. The uh, cold country's architecture is more compact with the outdoor is actually outside the building. And uh, while the, uh, in the desert, the open is actually the heart of the building. 
uh, the buildings uh, try to protect themselves from the harshness of the external weather. Now, when we design in modern architecture, we actually import, uh, without knowledge, the uh, architectural landscape of cold countries and try to adapt it to uh, our environment. And that. So I was fortunate that I got commissions to work in uh, different uh, areas with different climates. And, uh, and the first thing uh, I do is study the uh, heritage of that place and then compare it to my experience. Through that, I, I learned that one has to start understanding the cultural and environmental influence of uh, the uh, uh, culture and environment on, on architecture. And we try to learn from the heritage, but not necessarily to uh, design uh, within the limitations or the models of, uh, uh, of the heritage. Uh, here, uh, uh, I would show the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs staff housing, which I supervised uh, at the early stage of our work with, the, uh, with King Salman when he was uh, governor of Riyadh. And we tried to uh, avoid the problems that has created, we were created by the architecture uh, bylaws of the city, which forced architects to do inappropriate architecture for their environment and their social life. Uh, uh, this housing uh, project caters from the highest rank, which is the ambassador, to the lowest, which is the uh, uh, coffee boy or tea boys. And, and they all live together and sharing that. The cost of, of this project was about 30% less than a conventional, badly designed work. So, so it's not that uh, it has uh, a higher cost, but it has uh, a better environment and also achievable within a uh, reasonable cost. When we were commissioned to, de to, to design the uh, center of the diplomatic quarter, uh, known uh, now as the Kendi Plaza, uh, we thought that we want to, to go to the uh, heritage villages and start the way they think, or the way built, they start with the mosque. And, and there is no facade in, for the mosque, but really it is, it is actually a fabric uh, uh, where the uh, shops, housing, etc., and also we have the biggest open space and the governors or the military. So, so the idea here is that to create a context for architecture that is suitable for, for the uh, environment. Uh, this approach, uh, as we can see, uh, a traditional building to the right, which is the uh, uh, D1 office for uh, King Abdelaziz, and also an internal space in the diplomatic quarter. Uh, the idea here is that we, we try to uh, develop new architecture, but it's also learning from uh, the, the, the past. Uh, what is interesting uh, here is, is that the projects that were supervised by uh, King Salman when he was governor uh, got the largest number of international awards, and especially from the Aga Khan Award. So it was surprising why this single entity uh, wins so many awards for different projects. So there must be something very, very special about uh, uh, this attitude. So uh, the award actually singled out the Riyadh Development Authority as, as the uh, architect, well, they are not really architects, uh, that should uh, be uh, uh, giving the chairman's award. Uh, the idea here is that when we uh, think of what are the values, when uh, my contact with uh, His Majesty uh, in the beginning, I was just graduating from MIT and I started working in that. We were given the ch chance to experiment and so on. We were encouraged. 
But we were given the values rather than styles or, or, or a preconceived idea of what should be like in, in that. We incorporate local art, but in that. And in these two slides, we have huge projects. One is the Ministry of Education. It's one of the largest buildings, and it was uh, that it is the largest green building in, uh, in the universe. Uh, it, it caters for a, a huge uh, entity, but it, uh, it doesn't look huge. It's very human. Uh, we employed the transitional space as the, the most important uh, kind of space for, for desert architecture, uh, as in, in Riyadh. And, and then all offices, all spaces are within the natural lighting and ventilation in that uh, respect. So, and in the same thing in, in the competition for the uh, uh, municipality of Mecca, we wanted to develop uh, uh, even a more sustainable uh, architecture, which is actually derived from the Meccan la la landscape, the mountains and the, what we call it, the Shaab, which is the uh, wadis, uh, where we employ the uh, solar uh, energy to, to run the, the building and actually found that we can export electricity. So this is a building that is actually contribute to, to the, to the uh, sustainability of, of, the, of the city. Uh, it has a main street in, in the middle where everybody goes there and, and enjoys that, and then they can go to branching to the different area. So the, the uh, idea here is that architecture should be based on, on values that start from understanding the very local context, the, the immediate site, its characteristics, its neighbors, uh, uh, the requirements of, of the uh, client, the users, uh, and the neighboring area. And then we go up further level of, of the neighborhood or the city or, or the urban region or even the larger re, uh, region. So with this, we incorporate uh, the cultural uh, aspect uh, of, uh, of architecture at different levels. So, so we come to authenticity or, or the uh, heritage, how much you take from uh, history and, and how much you deviate from that. This is a, a, a situation the context will dictate. When uh, the uh, jury for the Ministry of Education uh, selected our design, they said this is, looks like a, a, a traditional uh, architecture, but has nothing from the features of the traditional architecture. And this is the summation that I have learned uh, from the values that now are incorporated in Mithaq uh, al-Malik Salman. Shukran. Thank you, architect Ali, for uh, this presentation. Uh, just uh, also, now we will have Mr. Angawi uh, for his presentation. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Pleasure to uh, be here. Ma ba Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, today I would like to speak about, um, about an order or about um, a mythology. Um, to every single point, there's always uh, a, a reference, especially if it's moving. And within this order of the universe that we see, um, everything revolved to, uh, toward the reference. And um, for us, this reference uh, as Muslims, is in Makkah. Once we uh, are far away from it, we pray towards it, 
and once we get close to it, we, we become circulating around it. And that's usually the nature of most of the uh, uh, structure or the, or the culture of, of Mecca. Uh, what, I, what I like to see in, in, in that diversity is that the multiculture, that uh, the celebration of diversity within, within Mecca itself, we believe that's the first house for all being. Um, and it believe also as well as the first house for, for everybody, not only for the Muslims. And when you see that celebration of, of diversity within the people that comes towards it from the pilgrimage, you will see how this builds up into a, a, a multicultural yet united. And within this um, order I was speaking about is that proportions that if you look around us within nature, within human, there's always a specific proportions and measurement um, before any designer or any architect or any artist start to draw. And so there's always a, a celebration of that, that unity uh, within our creations from the proportions of the human, from the beginning of uh, even the, uh, the growth of the flower, from the autumn and all the way to the uh, universe. There's always a certain common language, a universal language that can be applied. And you can see that very clearly even in the uh, particles of the snowflakes. Uh, it's been said that each uh, snowflake that had been fallen before, now, and on the future, all fits within the hexagonal grid, but none of them are uh, actually similar to, to one another. And that's a great example of showing the idea of unity within diversity, within nature. And when you apply it in architecture, especially in Islamic architecture, you would see that celebration of diversity, all the way from India, uh, Spain, and Morocco, and so forth. There is an order. The arches, there are different arches, but yet this, they are common within the same uh, proportions. And within the shapes of nature, you will see a commonality within that. Even when you apply it in, in craft, in this case, uh, the sacred text of calligraphy, as um, the diversity of the family tree that comes from, from a diwani or tulut or so forth, is always a beautiful uh, diversity within it, but yet they all uh, speak of that unity of beautiful handwriting. Um, so within, within this order, that from what I comprehend and understand, is always a constant and evolving, and between them you have a balance. Constant will give us continuity, evolving will give us evolution. Torah or tradition comes from continuity, evolution of will give us innovation, traditions will give us unity, and innovations will give us diversity. And the balance between them will give us, of course, equilibrium. And that's the beautiful result you can get. And it's always an ongoing, uh, um, continuous overlapping circles between generations and time. And I, I believe architecture, as, as, as mentioned as well, it's an extension of what we have been here on Earth. It's an extension of nature to have humans to live within a common space. And that fabric later on becomes an urban fabric. And in the case of uh, most of different cosmopolitan cities or so, there's always this continuing and building from what was been there before and built on top of it and continue with that. And that was always an issue, of course, with um, today's contemporary needs of how can you develop it. But when you look at the, um, the architecture of Hejaz in general and specifically in Mecca, you will see that beautiful uh, diversity between its trawashin, the wooden structural windows, the azure part, which is the brick uh, structure that you have on the top, and of course the arches and the, the doors. Is you would see this, each culture can familiarize with it, but yet it have this beautiful harmony that sits into one structure or one building. Everybody can have a sense of belonging to it, but yet it stands on by its own character and balance. And the, the haram and its, it's a beautiful uh, geometry and, and, and builds up. But you can see that even in the, the people themselves and the way they dress, the way they dress the turban and the clothing is always of that uh, diversity that you see. And in order to apply the concept of, of living tradition, w one needs to be breathing. I, I believe the craft of the past have always been breathing and seeing the demands of today's time and develop from it. They never have stopped to, to choose the best material or the best uh, design or object. 
based on what today's demands and need. And that's always a challenge and um, to continue something, but yet have the authenticity of it. And it should never stop. It should never be a contradiction between both. And this is a common uh, issue for all over the world. Uh, how can you really build up with your heritage, but yet keep up with uh, today's demand? And I would like to focus today more on the human element, which is the, the craftsman or the maker of those objects or those monuments. And of course, the connection to nature is, it's, is evident and it's always a, a beautiful relationship back and forth within the trees, if you would use the word, and other uh, local materials and how can you develop. Sometimes it will work and it will give you the guideline for the design because you're working with a specific resource or specific material from each region. Um, and that will give you uh, more the authenticity of, of the object and what can be used and can, what can it be developed to. A lot of those traditions or, or craft was meant to be for a specific demand of, the, uh, of that time. And it's never should be a contradicting uh, issue of developing or innovating within tradition as long as it's within the order of balance, as long as you keep the essence as a continuous element. Um, and I like to see it in three different um, stages as documentation, analysis, and then innovation. You will have to document and understand the object you're working with. You have to let on analyze it and then innovate within, within that once you understand its component or what we say the DNA of the object itself. And as a case study one, if you look at the Roshan, which is the wooden element within the windows, it has many different variations of it. But one of the main functions of it, of course, is to allow the natural uh, light and air within the space. And it became part of the identity of the, the building itself. It's a beautiful medium between the private and the public areas, so people can communicate um, uh, through it. And it has many different typology and many different shapes, different in different regions of, so say, the Roshan in Mecca, it's different Roshan in Medina and in Jeddah, but they also have a common essence to it. Um, and it, it, the way it, it has responsibility as well with the, with the public, with the alley in between, how the neighbors would communicate when you build within an urban uh, plan, it's a different, different kind of settings and needs of today's time of having uh, the neighborhood essence of to know your neighbor or to respect your neighbor through those structures, through those buildings. And the Mangur element, it's really um, uh, an ele uh, it's a wooden structure that you can see they, they overlap one another. We call that in Arabic the technique, ashiq When you take a lab joint and you connect them together, and usually they use no nail or glue in, in, in between. And that you can reach out by the precision of craft and when they cut uh, a piece and the geometry of it um, really depends on the grid, if it was used in a 45 degree grid or 90 degree grid. And it has many different names, but we, we call it um, in Roshan and we call it al Manjur, specifically in Arabic, al Manjur from al Najr al Khashab or from uh, al Naqr al Khashab. And um, it can exist by itself, as in this case, uh, in the picture, but the language of geometry, unfortunately, was really gone. A lot of the craftsmen who practice it uh, no longer knows um, the, the proportions. That's why you see sometimes a shift of that shape, the shift of that opening. Um, and the documentation, that kind of case, helps it to continue, helps it to revive, and helps it to, uh, to uh, even innovate within its language, within its uh, beautiful geometry. So when you look at the analysis of geometry and form, the building itself, then to the windows, and all the way to the smaller mm -hmm. element. Um, what we like to call those openings, as you can see, are letters. Um, there's the four-pointed star, the octagon, and other names, and there's also local names for them. And once you combine it together, you can, and you can have a creation of a, like a word. And then from this word, you can, when you put words together, you can create a sentence. And that's all fit within the grammar of Islamic architecture, from the micro to the macro. And of course, with the use of technology, of the use of today's time, you can determine even the percentage of light for each one of those opening. And if there's, sort of, if there's demand, if you're designing for a space or for a museum or for a living space, you can control the amount of light by understanding how much percentage of light goes through, through those beautiful shapes. And it depends on the client and what they develop. The, is an endless possibilities of design. There's an endless possibilities of variations of composition you can develop. 
And when you look at the, uh, the analysis of making, how is it done in the past, how is it done in the current time, and how can it be done in the future, as long as you lose this essence of the maker themselves. Um, I know there is a lot of demands of, to produce this in a bigger scale and production, but I would like to highlight the idea of the process of making something and what you can gain from it as a maker, what you can gain from it as a craftsman, and also how can you introduce this in, within uh, a society to introduce the idea of the soft power to enable uh, the community uh, to develop a craft. And each traditional city usually have an object that they can deliver. Uh, when you look at Jeddah, what is the object that it delivers? And what is the, the piece other than the architectural elements that it have? So introduction, of course, with this, uh, if you look at the machinery, you've seen, seen with the handwork, each one, of course, have its own uh, limitation and ability. But I like to think that there's always a combination of both that can, can be developed. And I believe you can innovate within, within tradition, especially if there's a need uh, for it. Um, in the case of waste, there's a lot of waste has been done in terms of cutting the trees and cutting the roshan and the wood itself. So there's ways to innovate within the techniques of making something other than the end result of how it looks. Uh, and that can be applied in many different uh, crafts within our tradition. But to, to, to have, uh, uh, to revive uh, um, a community of, of, of makers, and I, I believe we live in a time of the, uh, the evolution of makers because we have information now everywhere. And when from this information you can gain knowledge, and from this knowledge how can you apply either to make something physical or metaphysical from it. Um, and the, uh, I had an example um, of the, uh, fortunate to, 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 to develop a commission work in, in London to do something from our own tradition to apply it there. Uh, and of course, it had to respect the nature and, uh, of that place by choosing, first of all, the type of wood that is perfect for the climate, and at the same time, respecting the building that is, and usually in London, you have the sash windows, and you have their own Pacific grid, and if you apply your own tradition, there is have to be a dialogue between your own and others. And uh, talking about this community of makers, uh, you, you had a beautiful, diverse uh, group of team of workers uh, locally and internationally there. So we have a wide uh, range of different background uh, where each have developed and learned a technique of producing those rawashin and within the community that we had in, uh, in London. There was based on an example in, um, in Jeddah and, and seeing that diversity of craft and develops. We live in an age right now, I think, a lot of designers and architects have a big responsibility to, to understand how those materials are developed, how they are made, um, and how is the impact of it in nature and also within the social structure itself. And within um, the commission work that I got in the British Museum, so it was asked to design five screen windows, and each window carry uh, a story. And there was a specific demand of the amount of light that goes into the space. And that gave us the, the ability to really um, uh, innovate uh, a, a, a beautiful language within the same continuity of its order. And each section have its own uh, uh, it was a big challenge because you don't want to completely go away from its tradition and composition, but yet you have to work within an order in order to maintain it, but yet you can also add and innovate within it. And each one of those uh, windows was gone through a lot of uh, um, documents regarding the, uh, the, sh the shapes that it can create and the limitation you can work within the grid. Uh, and I also give it a shed of light you know, that to not only as a design, but still there is also makers uh, who does it uh, and develop it. Um, the, wool, the wood that was used was walnut wood because um, it, it was within the climate in London. We had to make the workshop in London because you have to treat the wood within the same climate of it. And it was a very interesting um, challenge to see how can you take your own tradition into uh, uh, a historical space like the, the, like the a building, like the British Museum building, and adopt something with, that have a dialogue within it. Within this piece, if you look at there is a, a bit of uh, uh, growth or, uh, as, a, as a design, and for this specific window, it was called the birth window, just to understand the idea that you, know, you have something that you continue with it as a line, but there's something you can always uh, innovate and develop with it, and it's always keep breathing and always give it a life for it to sustain. And within, within the shape, uh, 
it is a lot of uh, uh, interest in terms of the amount that can come uh, within the shades of light, the proportions of it. Um, and alhamdulillah, now in, in Jeddah, there's a lot of interest in developing the Rawashin. And, and there's a huge interest from the Ministry of Culture to document and analyze and to apply it even in contemporary buildings. Now, how each building now doesn't necessarily have to use wood in building it, but how can you still have this ritual or this habit within house? How can you allow natural light? How can you really use the uh, natural uh, sources um, and, and keep the building breathing from light and also from uh, uh, light itself? And when you see the visitors coming in, um, the beauty of reflection of light that comes in, you can see it how is it applying into the, uh, the visitors. And each person, when you move by um, um, those screens or those windows, the reflection of light uh, that comes within them, uh, and you can see the shape completely varies between the, the distance uh, of light when it hits them. Um, so I, I'm glad that I give a bit of shed of light within this uh, craft. And, and I hope really within this craft and others, it can be revived within uh, the bigger plan of architecture. Uh, even when you pl plan for new buildings or new cities, um, the essence of a human element is very much important for it to be part of the, um, the end result and to be part of its uh, continuation. What materials will get, who, which people work on this craft, and how can we innovate within this con beautiful continuation of, uh, of design and, and, and craft. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ahmed. Uh, I have a very small uh, note to our audience. Uh, we would like to encourage you to ask your questions uh, through the QR codes that display to your screen in the, uh, in the, uh, in the live streaming. And our questions will be displayed here in, uh, in the screens. Uh, let's start our discussion topics with uh, some questions. Uh, my first question will go to the Dr. Sumeya. Uh, Dr. Sumeya, what is the Architecture and Design Commission role in activating the Salmani architecture in the generation culture? Mm -hmm. um, so I think, first of all, when we talk about the Architecture and Design Commission, uh, we really have to understand the bigger role of what we are trying to do. Uh, so the commission itself actually is responsible for regulating the architecture and design sector and also elevating it um, and growing markets and, and really making sure that across the value chain uh, there is growth and development. So when we look at that mandate in the context of the King Salman Charter, it really is a matter of uh, us thinking about the initiative in a way that this initiative is a catalyst for, let's say, the intellectual exchange and also the promotion of creativity within the architectural space that goes beyond, let's say, the problem solving associated perhaps with engineering and many of the technical requirements that can be easily um, fulfilled in multiple ways, but really much more about a dialogue around um, you know, the, the cultural input and the human connection and, um, and all the different elements where architectural inputs are extremely, really important. Now, for us, we developed the charter and uh, published the book. It's currently available in Arabic and the English version is coming out very soon. Uh, we have a traveling exhibition across many cities of Saudi Arabia to really make sure that we engage our audience in their locations in the best way possible and also have multiple, um, let's say, activations and uh, incentives around that. So including, let's say, networking events for architects and designers. Um, but we also really want to go beyond that. So we developed a full strategy over the next three years where adopting the charter is going to mean a lot of different things to the different stakeholders um, uh, that it will engage with. So hopefully we, for us really this is just the beginning of you know, putting something in motion and then this is something that we know is going to be um, uh, uh, let's say an initiative that evolves as uh, perhaps you know we have more engagement with our audience um, and architects and we see the fruits of those uh, designs um, coming about in the next few years so hopefully um, you know there will always be you know the next version of that charter uh, with regards to award-winning architecture across the globe inshallah thank you doctor um, my next question is uh, for uh, mr uh, ali uh, yeah, if we, from your uh, practical perspective, how can national memory be created? 
Well, it's tough uh, to, to create uh, national uh, memory, but uh, in principle, uh, the, the first thing is that we need to protect our heritage. If we protect our heritage, it remains the source that people go back to. This is uh, an important thing. And the second is that we need to put a restriction on the demolition of, of structures without evaluating how they could be incorporated for the next generation. The, 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 the famous story about the uh, uh, station in New York, when they decided to keep it, they said, but it's not a beautiful building. So the argument was that it's, your, your wedding photo is very important to you, even when it's not a beautiful photo. So, so not necessarily that you uh, uh, keep what you have and try to uh, improve on it rather than de demolish. So, uh, and the memory for me is different from the memory of, of my children. They, they lived in a different context than I did. And also I, I have a different memory than my father. Uh, who lived in, in a different thing. So we need to maintain all these levels of, of memories and that will create the national uh, level. But it's very important to think of it as, as across the uh, spectrum of values and also types of environments. Thank you. Uh, my third question is goes to Mr. Angawi. Uh, what is your opinion to, on those who stress the importance of applying heritage in shaping contemporary architecture? Yes. Um, I think it's, it's an, an, an important issue to tackle and to, to really, the, the, the word contemporary or the word tradition, um, if you think about it as a verb, it's traditioning. It's not, it's not something always done in the past. It's always a continuing aspect. So, um, the contemporary is, every time is contemporary. At that time when you produce a work, it's a contemporary time for them. So how can a Arabi يعاصر التراث? It's an always a dialogue. And in order to, to put that, you always have to um, uh, have a discussion, a dialogue between what we have, what we've been passed on to generation and our tradition, and with uh, today's time and need. Um, in the past, of course, it wasn't an issue because maybe the makers or the craftsmen used to be the one person who built, the one person who produced. But now with the different sect of, um, uh, of knowledge of professionalism, there must be a dialogue in between. Um, and now we're also tackling the idea of, uh, of craft thinking in itself, thinking in itself, how can you apply it into, um, into the needs of producing an object or, or, or a building? Um, Definitely, you have to create more awareness, create more dialogue between uh, uh, multidisciplinary um, approach or synergy of, of that. Um, most schools, uh, design schools, or, or the important schools that have an impact had this kind of um, synergy between them. Um, within our own, we have beautiful uh, heritage. We have a deep understanding uh, uh, of our own treasure and, and knowledge. Uh, and now came the time, the perfect time to apply it uh, without having the contradiction of that. So once you apply uh, and gather the uh, different sect of people uh, into uh, institution, academic, even into workshops, it can really help a lot to, to push it in. And now I'm seeing amazing results. If you look at the Saudi Design Week recently that happened, if you look at it even before, the impact of, of having that gap in between, it became narrow and more narrow. And I think that will help a lot uh, to, um, to push that more towards uh, something that we can really feel comfortable with, something we can really see it as a functional, beautiful design piece, yet it carries something heritage and meaningful to us. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sumeya, how can we apply the King Salman Charter for architecture and urbanism? We have saw um, most of the examples that you showed in the presentation are local. Uh, but is it possible to apply this uh, Salmani architecture outside Riyadh or outside Saudi Arabia? Absolutely. Um, I think if we look at it, a lot of buildings, um, you know, there are a, a certain set of values that are embedded in buildings, even if they're not necessarily always very explicit in the story that we tell about these buildings. 
So, um, you know, specifically, let's say, sustainability, which has become, you know, a main consideration in many of the buildings that we have, and also perhaps, you know, from a client perspective, looking at, you know, how do we make this building quite rooted um, and to tell perhaps stories. Oftentimes, um, what I found it was quite interesting is that there's a little bit of a, um, a difference between countries in the way that they talk about architecture. So, for instance, for us, I think having gone through some sort of um, um, discontinuation, uh, which was very abrupt when it came to the vernacular um, and um, modern architecture coming in and in the expansion of cities, I think there has been a little bit of trauma that has always kind of stuck with us. So this question about who are we, how do we represent ourselves and so on. Whereas in other places where that process has been much more continuous and fluid, maybe that was never really part of the explicit conversation as we see it. So I think with the charter now, we're making some of these concerns, um, let's say uh, front and center in the conversation around these buildings. And we see perhaps a lot of the uh, award-winning buildings internationally that tell many stories of perhaps people who have been marginalized, for instance, cultural centers. And it's within how to give, let's say, a specific group of people a voice, uh, something they identify with, that that story becomes very uh, important. Um, and that is opposed to perhaps a lot of the architecture which is commercial, um, and driven by you know, return on investment in many city centers, or let's say trends and aesthetics where you know that they're changing so fast, where many of these considerations don't even come into play um, as explicitly. We think that the charter really does apply. We have a set of universal values that we have seen applied in different settings, but then if you really make them important, um, and I won't say equal, um, in all of the projects that we go for, then definitely the application of the charter is something that can happen at a global scale. Thank you. Uh, maybe we'll uh, have a couple of the questions from our uh, guests who are watching us online. Um, this question goes to uh, Mr. Angawi. How can the architecture and design committee can support craft and to improve it? I think this question, because <laughs> and already there is a lot of beautiful yeah. uh, initiative uh, in the ministry is doing, and, and mm -hmm. as I was mentioning, the gap is getting closer. Uh, uh, already, even from a high level, even with any project, especially in the historical Jeddah, there's always been an interest to work with, uh, uh, with craftsmen and with makers, and there's already a lot of maker spaces been developed and been supported by the, the Ministry of Culture. Um, I think more pockets in that within the community. Um, each neighborhood definitely have somebody who, uh, who is a maker or some sort. Um, so if that develop uh, more within the community centers and that uh, spread around this, uh, the kingdom, um, you will introduce that. You, once you give them the facility, the, the machinery needed or the knowledge needed, you will find uh, uh, more, more of that uh, gap um, getting close. But definitely, I will, the question, Dr. Sumaya will definitely answer it more better than me. <laughs> Do you prefer to answer? So I'll maybe add on to that. Yeah. And um, so to clarify also, um, we have under the Ministry of Culture, we have 11 commissions. One of them is architecture and design, but then we also do have a heritage commission. So from our perspective, because part of our mandate also covers industrial design, we see that there's such a continuation between crafts and industrial design in the sense that the Heritage Commission would be responsible for you know, keeping the authenticity of the crafts alive, the materiality and the understanding uh, what came and uh, the, the methods and the processes behind them. But from our perspective, it's really also about, you know, how do we innovate on that and how do we then bring it into contemporary practice, not just to make it contemporary, but rather to, to go beyond, let's say, the aesthetic component to the purpose why that was there. And how do we take that, um, whether we are innovating with the different materials, the shapes, the functions, all of these aspects really then uh, come into play. And um, as uh, Mohammed was um, eloquently saying, I mean, the making now is, is quite big and uh, I think all the craft components in terms of let's say uh, are we providing enough maker spaces do we have the expertise that we can um, you know bring to locals who want to experiment all of these are embedded within our strategy so really to also activate uh, the third sector. So we encourage the development of many associations, um, hobby groups, um, 
all the different clubs out there um, and supporting them to get to a level where they themselves can make, but with our support, hopefully getting to, um, let's say, frontiers that they haven't uh, dreamed of. Great. Um, I have another question to uh, architect Ali from um, Mohammed Dalila. He's asking, where do you see the direction of contemporary architectures going with the next generation? Um, of, of absolutely for architects and designers. Uh, with, with the role of the technology, I mean. What I think is that has changed in the world, uh, the architects are no longer free to do whatever monkey business they used to. Uh, uh, we, the uh, cities had enough of architects who have the stamp of themselves everywhere they go, rather than spring their architecture from the root of the place where they start. So contextual architecture is, is becoming now a requirement in, in most countries. Uh, codes are being uh, developed in, in many countries in England, like you start with the uh, design guidelines that starts from urban planning and, and then goes down to uh, the uh, guidelines for, for quality of architecture and how it relates to the immediate environment and again how to to design the streets and bring them back to to the pedestrian so the humanization of the city is becoming now the rule so the architects are no longer uh, free like what we had before we had no control over the uh, uh, architects they can design in whatever they like to do whatever the material, whatever the shapes, without reference to, to, the, to the local context. This is one. Two, also we, we suffered from the bylaws that the city in different countries had uh, influenced architecture so that it would be anti-human. Uh, in, in our cities, you cannot walk, it's not safe because everybody is, is a, uh, uh, inside the house, uh, they have, they cannot go outside. Children are always scared to go to the street. It's not safe. Women cannot walk. The uh, low densities in uh, in cities because uh, uh, force people to use the car, and by using the car, you you lose the human contact and the values. And our cities are becoming white elephants. It's very expensive now to, to maintain our cities. We don't know how our municipalities can maintain whatever they have in hand now. So, so the, now in, in most of the world, they are uh, 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 taking back whatever they had as the regulations, like in the States, the uh, uh, single living unit uh, zoning is being abolished every day by one of the cities in that. So, so the, the principle is that now there is control over the values that control the quality of architecture for the human being and for the sustainability of the community. Thank you, thank you so much. There are uh, so many questions to you, Dr. Sumeya, but I will pick the last uh, question uh, for tonight. Um, the question is asking which project will need to align with the charter? Is it only the key cultural projects or any building or, or architecture or space uh, in Saudi? Mm -hmm. uh, so one thing to clarify is that the charter is completely voluntary. So if, you know, let's say architects or even clients don't want to apply it, that's completely up to them. There's no restriction on it. For us, really, we wanted to make this a space that, you know, encourages people to adopt it rather, and for us to then award them um, and incentivize them to do so, rather than to, you know, have this as something that is part of the regulation and then penalized. Uh, so there is no restriction. However, um, I think some projects lend themselves so much better to, let's say, the application of the charter, especially when they're large-scale um, urban uh, projects uh, where there's uh, different stakeholders uh, that come together, specifically um, thinking about you know, these public spaces, open areas, um, as well as functions that, that are um, within them. So 
it, it is quite open, and uh, we'll leave it at that. Thank you, Dr. Samia. We would like to have more questions, but we are sorry. We are running uh, out of, uh, of time. So if you have any questions, you can step uh, aside to ask our guest uh, for tonight. Uh, special thanks to our guest, Dr. Samia, architect Ali, and Mr. Angawi. We would like to give them a round of uh, applause. Thank you everyone for being part of this talk and we are looking forward to have uh, you in upcoming uh, events and talk in Saudi Pavilion. Good night. <laughs>